Coming up on DTNS, more of what tech companies are doing to fight COVID-19, what part of Sony just got spun out, and everybody's using Zoom, but is it safe to do so? Shannon helps us figure out. That's true. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, March 27th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Colorado, Shannon. Congrats on the move. That's amazing. Thank <gasps> you. Woo-hoo. It's pretty cool to have Colorado represented more often. You occasionally get like a Brian Ibbett or something, but uh, this is good. Uh, we were just pitching a show called Lockdown about the Locke family under lockdown. Uh, it's our brand new sitcom from DTNS Studios. It's going to be fantastic. If you'd like to find out the details, you got to become a member of our Patreon and get good day internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Instacart workers led by the Gig Workers Collective plan to strike in the U.S. Monday demanding Instacart provide personal protective equipment, $5 extra per order, hazard pay, change the default tip to 10%, and extend sick pay qualification to people with pre-existing conditions. Bleeping Computer reports a security consultant in the Proton VPN community found a vulnerability in the VPN in iOS 13.3.1 version that may leave some traffic unprotected. Connections to the internet made before the launching the VPN will remain outside of the security tunnel. Apple is aware and they are working on a way to fully mitigate the problem. In the meantime, users of the VPN on iOS are advised to use always on VPN or turn airplane mode on and then off after initiating VPN to kill all the connections, which will then reconnect them within the tunnel. Google's threat analysis group says it sent account holders almost 40,000 warnings of targeted and government-backed hacking in 2019, attacks really, uh, down 25% from 2018. Government officials, journalists, dissidents, and geopolitical rivals were the most often targeted. Countries with residents that collectively received more than 1,000 warnings included the United States, India, Pakistan, Japan, and South Korea. A Yelp and GoFundMe fundraising program to help local businesses affected by COVID-19 has been paused after people complained, at least business owners anyway, that there was no easy or quick way to opt out of the fundraising without providing a driver's license or business ID verification or otherwise kind of a complicated process. Not everybody wanted this, turns out. Yelp now says it's working with GoFundMe to create a more seamless approach where businesses would have to opt in. Facebook launched a coronavirus community hub for Messenger that will offer authoritative information from organizations like the World Health Organization, as well as recommended activities for users to do remotely. Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield uh, made some waves when he told CNBC that Slack is working on integration with Microsoft Teams for calling features. I mean, Slack will integrate with pretty much everything. So I guess it shouldn't be a surprise that they want to integrate with their direct competitor, Microsoft Teams. Uh, Butterfield, however, did not mention a timeline for that development. Google announced it will resume updates to Chrome with plans to release Chrome 81 on April 7th. A new version was scheduled for release on March 17th, but the company suspended updates on Chrome browser and Chrome OS to avoid disruptions as people started working from home. An official Chrome 82 release has been canceled with features rolled into Chrome 83, which is expected in mid-May. And Google increased the maximum number of people who can participate in a Google Duo call from eight people up to 12. Google increased Duo group call sizes from four to eight in May of 2019. Cisco reports that spikes in internet traffic seem to be concentrated now between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. The normal peak time of 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., that's usually when everybody gets home and watches Netflix, has increased slightly but is not the primary driver of the overall increase in internet usage. However, the traffic load from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., while being the biggest increase, is still below evening peak hours. So that's good because the entire internet is tuned for peak hours. Streaming video still happens in the evening, it turns out. Mm -hmm. Amazon confirmed a Recode report that its shopping algorithm gave preference to some of its own non-essential items like sporting equipment and office supplies over third-party sellers with faster ship times. Amazon says it's working as quickly as possible to resolve this issue. 
And several food wholesalers that sell to restaurants are now developing online delivery features as restaurant orders drop by 70%. Uh, a couple of examples, Cafe Deli Wholesale in the UK has launched a website overnight where anybody can order delivery from them. Fresh Pastures, which supplies dairy and bread to governments and schools, uh, has lost 90% of its business because all the schools are closing, uh, now offers delivery to the public from its website. So if you're looking for groceries, you might look around for some wholesalers. All right, let's talk about what's going on with Sony Corporation, Shannon. All right. Sony Corporation announced that it plans to create a holding company for its, quote, electronic products and solutions business called Sony Electronics Corporation, which is effective on April 1st. So this would include image imaging products and solutions, home entertainment and sound, and mobile communications. Sony Executive Vice President Shigeki Ishizuka, who headed the unit under Sony Corporation, will be the CEO of the new company. Semiconnectors, financial services, game and network services, music and pictures are all not included under the new holding company. And in related news, Sony also says that its PS5, the PlayStation 5 launch, is still planned for the holiday season of this year. Yeah, there have been some rumors kicking around that Sony might have to delay, and that would be understandable with supply chain issues being what they are. Uh, but Sony's still sticking to it. They're saying we haven't delayed it yet. Uh, so that's that's good to know. Uh, this this is this spin-out story that you mentioned, Shannon, is, is confusing a lot of people because it's imaging, meaning cameras, digital cameras, SLRs, things like that. It's not the image sensors that Sony makes because they make a lot of money off that. Uh, so this is just Sony's consumer electronics getting packaged up into a wholly owned uh, company to make it easier to sell if they decide to do that. Doesn't mean they have decided to sell it, but it's certainly one of the first steps towards saying, if we did want to get out of this business, the way they got out of VIO, they got out of the VIO business a few years ago, uh, they could get out of this business of the stuff you find in a Best Buy or a car phone warehouse, the stuff you mm -hmm. find on the shelves that's you know your, your right. home consumer electronics stuff. I mean, Maybe. It, it does roll off the tongue a little bit better, electronics, rather than electronic products and solutions, which would cause people to be like, okay, what solutions? I, I think some of the gaming stuff, it, it's, I understand that Sony wants to make its gaming its own category. That makes sense. So I guess that would be the only category you're like, well, that's electronics, but okay, gaming is separate. Otherwise, this seems just like a renaming that makes sense. Yeah, PS5 is separate from this. Uh, all of the gaming like uh, software services that they offer, that's separate from this as well. Um, something that is included is, you know, TVs, mm -hmm. any of the audio kind of techno technological information that they have out there, like headphones or like um, audio players. Those are going to be included under the Electronics Corporation. So it does sound like it's everything that they offer consumers at like Best Buy, except for video games gaming. <laughs> yeah. And there, there's been an activist investor pushing Sony to do similar things to this. Uh, I imagine that giving uh, the downward guidance that all electronics companies are facing uh, going into the end of the year, it may have forced their hand a little bit. Uh, Daniel Loeb, uh, Loeb, L-O-E-B, has been trying to get Sony to, to make these kinds of changes. So it's, uh, I, I, would, I don't know if it's a result of, of the virus and the disruption, uh, but it certainly could have been. Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo previously released a note predicting that ARM-based Macs could arrive as early as Q4 of 2020. That's this year. A new note from Kuo predicts that Apple will adopt a, quote, aggressive processor replacement strategy throughout 2021, including desktops. Kuo predicts the CPU switch could save Apple 40 to 60 percent on the component cost. Other changes caused by this would be the need to source a USB controller, since Apple uses the one integrated in Intel chips currently. Kuo believes that Apple might go with AS Media's USB controller in ARM models, and the note also predicts that Apple will adopt USB 4 in Macs by 2022. Uh, I mean, Quo, like you said, he previously was talking about ARM coming to Max. This is just more of the plan. Uh, he's, mm -hmm. He seems to have found some more sources to tell him a little more of what Apple's thinking. Apple's thinking probably has evolved since he first talked about this. And it does make sense that Apple would want to do this if they feel like these ARM-based Macs are powerful enough and just kind of slowly work their mm -hmm. way up the power chain as they develop these chips themselves. A lot of questions about whether they will be powerful enough, well, you know, whether there will be bugs and things like that. Uh, but ARM increasingly is a perfectly reliable chipset 
for laptops. Uh, I don't see Apple putting this in, say, the iMac or even or the Mac Pro, probably the Mac Mac Pro for sure, maybe not even the iMac, but but for laptops, uh, ARM-based. My question is, will you get a powerful enough Pro laptop model out of this uh, on ARM? And I guess yep. we'll, we'll see. And is it too much of a pipe dream to hope that saving on the component cost could pass savings along to the consumer as well? Oh, Sarah. I just <laughs> want to know. What? I mean, Apple? What a no. lovely thought. All right. Pipe dream it is. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a pipe dream or not. I am curious if, uh, same thing, if the laptops are going to be powerful enough. I, for one, know a lot of YouTubers who do their own editing on Apple laptops, everything from regular mm -hmm. airs all the way up to pros. And I, I'm not as familiar with ARM processing as uh, on, on laptop machines other than like, you know, a Chrome Chromebook, basically, uh, as I would like to be. And I'm I am not familiar with any of them being able to run something like Adobe um, Photoshop or Adobe Premiere Pro uh, in a in a way that is useful enough that somebody could still edit in like 4K, for example. Uh, I still feel like in a lot of cases, you still need a desktop for that kind of machinery or you need something that is very pro, pro line, like top of the line laptop. So I don't know, it's gonna be interesting seeing them switch over to ARM if this does happen in Q4 of 2020, like they're saying. Well, it, I don't think they're going to move their entire product line immediately over to ARM. But no, that's I, not what he's saying. He yeah, said that they yeah, would slowly yeah. change it over the course of 2022. Exactly. Right, starting so, as early as that. Yeah, so they'll probably just test the waters and then go over from Over the there. course of 2021. Yeah. yeah. Uh, aggressive processor replacement strategy throughout 2021. He does say including desktop, so I guess that includes mm -hmm. iMac. Uh, and before we get off the story, the other thing, Sarah, that you were mentioning is people complaining like, oh, this is going to be just as bad as when they switch to Intel and we're going to have incompatibilities and all that stuff again. Yeah, and and I I have seen some... It, the <laughs> Again, it's a little hard to say. Is you know, is this a, somebody who has PTSD from you know going to x86 back in the day? I, there are definitely going to be certain programs that I don't know. But, you know, there might be some incompatibility issues uh, as as switchovers make sense. I'm excited about the USB four stuff. Uh, read up about it a little bit this morning. I mean, Apple's not the the only uh, uh, company that is going to be able to take advantage of this, and obviously, it's it it depends a lot on 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 how com components are built that would daisy chain all sorts of things. But uh, it's the future and it's yeah. gonna be backwards compatible. A lot of stuff I already have, yay. And they could go USB four if they stayed on Intel. That that's mm -hmm. that's a part of this. It's just uh, I think Quo mentioned that if they do use AS Media, they'd start with current USB controller, but mm -hmm. adopt USB four by 2022. So that that, that kind of just puts it on the roadmap. All right, let's do a roundup of uh, some of the things that tech is doing to help fight COVID nineteen. We talk a lot about the effects of it. I'm sure you hear a lot about what the effects may or may not be in all kinds of arenas. But on this show, we kind of want to focus on the fact that there are also efforts to help stop it, to help cure it, to help ease it, to help slow it. Uh, Apple, for instance, has launched a COVID-19 screening site and app in the United States in cooperation with the US CDC and FEMA. Uh, it provides tips and advice. So basically you go in and you can ask questions, you can self-diagnose and see if you need to contact a healthcare professional. It's, it's just an informational resource. It's not a diagnostic app per se. Alphabet's Verily Health Technology, however, has more than a thousand volunteers from across Alphabet companies, including Google, working on its drive-through COVID-19 screening and testing for at-risk people. Testing locations are up and running in California, in San Mateo, Santa Clara, Riverside, and Sacramento counties. More test sites will open based on where the state says they are most needed. C3.ai and Microsoft are launching the C3.ai Digital Transformation Institute dedicated to funding collective research efforts on AI to help government businesses and society uh, use them to best advantage. It's a generalized AI initiative, but the first call is for research proposals to fight COVID-19 and tackle other possible future pandemics. The Institute will be jointly managed by the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Proposals should be submitted by May 1st and selections will be announced June 1st. A team at Singapore's NanoBioLab at the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research have developed a test that can tell if a person has COVID-19 in five to 10 minutes. 
based on a swab collection. So they swab probably your throat, uh, and they can turn this around in five to 10 minutes. Fast, faster testing is, is very important in being able to test more people, obviously, and the team has conducted clinical validation and hopes to be able to submit it for approval in Singapore in a month. Yeah, I mean, I I only have heard about uh, testing process because I have not been tested myself, but it was a lot longer than five to ten minutes. You know, in mm -hmm. some cases, several hours, and that's yeah, not hours. even not even accounting for who might be in front of you type thing. Exactly, exactly. The UK's Dyson has designated a or sorry designed a ventilator it calls Covent using Dyson's current digital motor technology. This design was specifically for patients who have COVID-19. The United Kingdom's NHS has ordered 10,000 units from Dyson pending regulatory approval. Uh, Dyson also plans to donate 5,000 ventilators to organizations around the world. A lot of good technology going on in, in the ventilator category. Good on you, Dyson. Sky reports the UK's National Health Service is also preparing a platform to track movements of critical staff and materials. This was developed by the U.S. company Palantir. The platform will track accident and emergency capacity, calls to NHS's 111, uh, the number and location of open beds, ventilators, and active NHS staff. UK tech firms have created COVID-19 Tech Response, an organization at Code4, the number four, Code4COVID.org, to coordinate available talent with uh, the ability to solve problems that need solving. Coalition is working closely with the Coronavirus Tech Handbook, an initiative by Political Technology College Newspeak House, as well as COVIDMutualAid.org. This is similar to one we talked about earlier uh, this week that's happening in the U.S. that says, hey, if you guys are product managers, engineers, uh, developers, uh, we've got problems we need you to solve. Let's put you together with the people that need those problems solved. Similarly, 400 volunteers from 40 countries have joined the COVID-19 CTI League. CTI stands for Cyber Threat Intelligence. The top priority of this organization is to help defend medical facilities, health organizations, and other frontline responders from cyber attacks. It will also work to defend communications networks, uh, leverage contacts in the internet infrastructure to combat phishing and other financial crime that's taking advantage of COVID-19 fears. The four coordinators of the group include Mark Rogers. He's a Brit who lives in the U.S. and also the head of DEF CON. Uh, there's also an Israeli and two people from the U.S. running this. But it's basically, Shannon, trying to get people who are in the, uh, the cyber defense industry to help defend healthcare. Yeah, and honestly, I've I've seen a ton of hackers and white hats uh, on places like I, I'm a part of that community, like on Twitter, um, talking about ways that they can help. So I've seen a huge initiative from the hacker industry in ways to do this. And um, Mark Rogers, who uh, again he's the head of DefCon Security, um, being you know all the people that run the security at the convention, um, it's smart that he's getting into this because it's he's one of the people that already knows how to coordinate a large group of hackers. So he right. understands what needs to go into that and what kind of goals and how they can plan it, you know, over the course of several weeks probably, but also across several different timelines and um, several different nations. So this is something that he's familiar with working with that convention for a very long time. And I know that having him in charge as well as the other three people is definitely an, an initiative that we need right now. So I'm really excited to see hackers coming together and doing doing this uh, because I think a lot of people don't give hackers credit and we are a very tight knit community that has a lot of empathy and it's really nice to see us, you know, pulling for this to happen. Hey folks, if you get all the tech headlines in about five minutes, it must mean you're subscribed to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, folks, uh, as we know, video conference usage is soaring. Uh, for both business and just cocktail purposes, uh, all kinds of purposes. According to Aptopia's estimates, downloads of House Party, the one that lets you have eight people together, has some gaming stuff in it, that's gone from 24,795 downloads per day on February 15th to 651,694 downloads March 25th. Discord also fly in there, 219,585 downloads February 15th 
up to 443,480 on March 25th. Marco Polo, uh, a friend of mine in, back in Greenville, introduced me to this one. It has gone from 12,674 downloads on February 15th to 73,395 downloads March 25th. Marco Polo lets you do a live stream, but also leave video messages for each other. Kind of interesting. But dwarfing them all is Zoom. Downloads of Zoom have risen from 171,574 on February 15th to 2,410,171 on March 25th, uh, just skyrocketing. And it seems like every celebrity you hear of, who every business you hear of, they're all using Zoom to do their conferencing. But Zoom has a checkered history when it comes to security and privacy. Uh, there was a vulnerability which let an attacker remove attendees from meetings, spoof messages from users and hijack shared screens. Last year, it was found that websites could use Zoom to activate a Max webcam without asking permission. Uh, and all of those have been fixed. And of course, every tool is going to have a history of vulnerabilities. But some people feel like Zoom hasn't always taken these seriously and doesn't look to fix them until they're already waved in front of their face. Uh, for instance, Motherboard uh, did some analysis indicating Zoom's iOS app uses the Facebook Graph API to notify Facebook of app opens, device details, model, carrier, time zone, city, even if the Zoom user doesn't have a Facebook account. Now, Facebook lets you do this as part of the API, but Facebook says it requires a developer to be transparent with users about the data their apps send to Facebook. In fact, the terms say, if you use our pixels or SDKs, you further represent and warrant that you have provided robust and sufficiently prominent notice to users regarding the customer data collection, sharing, and usage. However, the Zoom privacy policy does not mention the Facebook API by name. It just talks about using third-party tools in rather vague language. Mm. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has pointed out that there are also other privacy issues that you may not be aware of. They're transparent, they're known, but the end user might not know that the host of a Zoom call can monitor the activities of the attendees while screen sharing. You can see if your window's active or not to tell if you're not paying attention. Uh, administrators can see detailed dashboards of users' activity, including a ranking system of users based on total number of meeting minutes. Uh, if a user records a call, the administrator can access the contents of that recording that you made on your side. And during any meeting that has occurred or is in progress, administrators can see operating system, IP address, location data, device information, et cetera. In a corporate situation, this may all be expected, but a lot of situations are not the normal right now. So, Shannon, how much do we need to worry about using Zoom, given its history and these current privacy policy issues. So folks might disagree with me a little bit when I say this, but um, honestly, these are very similar issues that you see with a lot of these uh, platforms that are used for work environments so that people can collaborate, they can talk, they can converse. Um, in that sense, I would say that you don't necessarily have to worry about what is being shared with Zoom or with the company that you are working for, especially if you're in that kind of corporate environment, like you said, Tom, where it's expected and it might even be a part of your employee handbook already. So that's something that you should be aware of and make the assumption that anything that is happening on a Zoom call or any other platform is going to be publicized. And that's kind of a, a rule is trust no one, just assume that whatever you're putting out there, whatever you're saying or whatever is being shown behind you is going to be publicized in some way, not just to the people that are in the same conversation with you on that conference call, but also maybe to Zoom if they have the mm -hmm. ability to do that, but also to anybody else who might inadvertently get access to that call, even if it's like screen recorded and uploaded to YouTube as a unlisted video, you never know who's going to get access to that. Um, there are some ways that you can circumvent what Zoom is doing they do have security issues. So you can turn off your computer and mic during calls whenever you're not the one talking or you're not the active user, you're just listening in. Uh, you can totally do that as long as, you know, the company that you're working with is comfortable with you doing that and allows you to do so. Again, you have that issue with a corporate environment. Um, you can also 
just need to be aware of what's in your background image. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure that you're not recording against a whiteboard that has like usernames and passwords written on it. I've definitely seen that before in my own environments. Uh, and be aware of what is behind you, whether it's just, you know, a bookshelf like this with nothing in particular back there, or if it's a whiteboard with stuff written on it. You may want to make sure that it's not something that you're sharing that should be secure. Um, you use unique email addresses for Zoom. Check other accounts and make sure that you're using, uh, if you are che checking separate accounts, make sure you're using a different device like your phone. Mm -hmm. So if you are in that corporate environment, your boss doesn't necessarily know that you're checking your email at the same time. Because <laughs> if you want to avoid triggering attention trackers, that might be a way around it. Not saying that you should, but it's a way. Uh, and make sure that you're opting out or blocking any kind of trackers or cookies that Zoom might be initiating on your computer as well. Um, but of course, Zoom might not be the best option for everybody, uh, especially if you are in a uh, environment that shares proprietary information, for example. So you might want to use a alternative. So luckily, there are a couple of different alternatives. My favorite is Signal, which I absolutely love. I use it every single day for years and years. Uh, they have disappearing messages that you can set to different times just for texts, encrypted end-to-end -end signal uh, conversations with other signal users. So your friends or family or colleagues need to use signal as well. Video calls are also encrypted and you can verify who you're talking to if it's just over text with something called a safety number. Um, I won't go into the details, but signal's free. And the only con I would say with that is that it's one-on-one -on -one calls with people. The other one is conference calls with wire, uh, which the pro is it's open source encrypted and to get and you do get conference calls. The cons is it does require a pro subscription. So it is like four bucks. Yeah. So if you if it's worth paying for your privacy, I guess wire would be the one for you. So if yeah. you only need to do one on one signal.org. Good, good yeah. alternatives. Thanks, Shannon. No problem. <laughs> a lot of security and privacy conversations happen all the time in our Discord, and you should join. And you can do it by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We're going to call this person Stealth. Stealth is from too damn sunny Los Angeles. Used to be anyway. Uh, and this is why. Full disclosure, Stealth is on the technology team at Disney Television Animation. Says, I don't speak for them, but writing in anyway. Deadline, Deadline.com, had a story on how while traditional video production is shutting down due to coronavirus concerns, animation production is adapting to a new remote work reality. The article talks about the challenges of moving artists and animators from a high bandwidth office to home internet connections. And just today, I was part of a 40-plus person Zoom call. Well, that <laughs> sounds fun. Uh, and the, it, it, this is, um, thank you, Stealth. The article goes into some detail on just stuff that the production world, which has largely been affected. I mean, any of your late night shows, they're either not doing anything or they're <laughs> streaming from home. But, uh, you know, folks in the uh, voiceover industry, the stuff that can be done remotely that just doesn't require some of the big studio setups and large crew that, that, that other productions have had to just just not be able to accomplish is really interesting. So thank you for that. Yeah. So in other words, uh, about four to five months from now, all of our new television shows will be animated. Got it. Because <laughs> yeah. everything else cool. is top down. Yeah. Anybody has voiceover work for me? Just send it on over. Yeah, no Add. kidding. Me too. <laughs> right. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Andrew Bradley, Justin Zellers, and Tim Deputy. Len Peralta, what have you been drawing today? Well, you know, I too have jumped on the Zoom uh, track and uh, done some, uh, not um, meetings, but recordings as well. And I'm always afraid of that. I've been using Google Meet for uh, my stuff. Uh, and, you know, privacy is a thing of the past, folks. And I, you know, <laughs> one of the things is I feel that this image is, uh, it all comes down to the Zuck. Right. Because the Zuck is going to get any sort of information, you know, and I seem to have draw, I draw Mark Zuckerberg a lot as this sort of like tentacled creature, like alien <laughs> guy. And uh, this image is uh, it shows that uh, Zuck's uh, tentacles 
uh, can go into all kinds of places, including where you are zooming from. So just uh, as a uh, as a cautionary tale, just be careful what you're sharing. Know what you're going into, and uh, know that privacy is a thing of the past. Um, this image is available right now at patreon.com uh, slash Len. And I also want to mention that if you have, you know, there are birthdays, there are anniversaries, there are uh, you know, uh, things happening in the next couple months that uh, would need greeting cards. And I'm, I have a special at my uh, shop right now. It's a custom drawn quarantine greeting card. Oh, uh, nice. you can, uh, you can go ahead, uh, you can order one, uh, and you can send a special meeting, uh, special, uh, message to someone who is on lockdown or quarantine right now. And if they can't, you know, have a birthday party that they want, at least you can give them something that is, uh, that is different and new and interesting by me. So uh, go to lenperaltstore.com. Excellent. Thank you, Len. Good stuff today. Also, thanks to Shannon Morris for being with us from her brand new studio. Shannon, what's been going on with you and how can people keep up with your work? Um, well, I've moved and I'm building my new studio, as you mentioned. So youtube.com slash Shannon Morris is where you will see all my newest videos from Colorado. Excellent. Uh, hey, folks, uh, we've been taking this portion of the show to kind of spread the love around to other people who are creators, uh, who you can support, can can give you some fun stuff to look at, to enjoy. Uh, and uh, we, we got an email from one of the listeners who's trying to do something to help teachers. Uh, not every student can read printed materials the same way. Some students need large text uh, or audio versions or Braille versions and other kinds of versions. And with teachers relying more on printed material for distance learning right now, this risks letting some students go without the needed information while teachers are waiting for services to convert materials or trying to, you know, struggle through creating them themselves. Uh, so Scribe for Education is a program from NUMA Solutions developed to help teachers across the globe provide accessible documents with a couple of clicks. DTNS listener Mike Calvo is the founder and CEO of NUMA Solutions. They are making Scribe for Education free for teachers and school districts worldwide. This is not a paid announcement. Mike just told me about this and I'm passing it along because I think it's great. Uh, so if you're a teacher or school district and you're interested, uh, go to Numa Solutions, P-N-E-U-M-A solutions.com uh, and uh, look for the link in our show notes or you can even call uh, 305-720-3639. We'll have that phone number in the show notes as well. You can always support our show at any level. Thanks for everybody who's been stepping up just got another email. Uh, I think this one was from Soren, who uh, said, you know what, I'm going to step up and increase my pledge a little bit to cover those people who are getting furloughed and getting laid off. Uh, super appreciate that. Patreon.com slash DTNS. You might be wondering, gosh, I wish I could just give some feedback to the folks at DTNS. I have good news. You can. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com is where to send an email. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Slash live. Monday is the 15th anniversary of the launch of CNET's Buzz Out Loud. And coincidentally, Molly Wood will be here on Daily Tech News Show. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>